Hello, good morning. Thank you for being on time. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so the plan is to finish lecture four uh, and um, depends how much time we have left. We probably will we'll do have a, a, a little bit of time. Um, and if so, we're going to move on to uh, lecture five as well. So uh, where did we left last time? Last time we were talking about uh, production of ATP, right? And uh, we basically need to use the energy from catabolic reactions, um, the reactions that involves breaking uh, molecules down. Uh, and, and in the process, you're going to be releasing energy. So we can capture that energy um, and, and lock it in the form of ATP. Uh, and then we can use the ATP for various things. We can use it for mechanical work, which involves the movements of um, either a cellular part or body parts. Um, we can use it to transport material across the cell membrane, or we can use it for chemical work. So that's where we left off last time. Um, so today we will be looking at the different types of transport that occurs within the body uh, across the cell membrane. Some will require energy, others will not. We're going to look at the difference between them. The simplest type of uh, transport is what we call diffusion. Right? Diffusion involves the movement of substances from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Right? So if you add uh, a drop of uh, a few drops of uh, food coloring into um, uh, a flask of water, the dye will slowly spread out in the container without you doing anything to it. It is a spontaneous process. It just happens on its own. No input of energy is required. So when you add the dye, right, it's very concentrated here and there's no dye here. So that is low concentration and the dye will naturally again spread from area of high concentration to area of low, excuse me, area of low concentration. And, and that process is what we call diffusion. Now that's the most common type of transport that happens in, uh, in any system. Now there are different factors that affects the rate of diffusion. Um, how fast is the substance going to spread essentially is going to be affected by a few things. Number one, it's going to be affected by size. Things that are smaller tends to move faster compared to the larger ones. So over here, we have uh, O2 molecule. Right? So that's really small, only two atoms. Uh, over here, we have glucose, which is a lot, well, it's not a lot bigger, but like bigger than, than O2 here. So you would expect the oxygen to be able to diffuse uh, faster compared to something like glucose. Temperature will also affect the rate of diffusion. When it's hotter, molecules are more energetic. They tend to move faster and therefore spread out faster. Just think about it, right? Um, on a hot summer day, if you walk by like a dumpster or something, or even like you're taking your own garbage out, right? You're more uh, likely to smell the uh, a bad smell from the from the garbage on a, on a hot summer day compared to a cold winter day, right? That's because the smell diffuses faster uh, uh, when when it's hotter. Excuse me, one second. Sorry, the allergies is still very, very strong for me this season. Uh, all right, so the th third factor that affects the, um, the rate of diffusion is the steepness of concentration gradient. What is a concentration gradient? Okay. Concentration gradient just means there is a difference, difference in concentration between two locations. Okay. So how much of a difference are we talking about? Very big difference or subtle difference? If the difference is really, really big, then we say the steepness is higher. 
Right? So when you have two locations, like here, um, point A and location A and location B, you have a lot of particles in, in A, but nothing in B. So the steepness of the concentration gradient here is greater than the steepness of the concentration gradient over here, because you have nothing in part B in this picture, but then you already have some here, right? So if the difference is really big, then diffusion tends to be faster. If the difference is not that big, you will still have diffusion. Things will still move over, okay? but it's not going to be happening as fast. Right? So size, temperature, steepness of the concentration gradient. The last factor is uh, uh, that we're going to talk about is charge. Okay, so um, over here, if you look at this, we have a bunch of H plus on one side and then other H plus on the other side, right? So what happens is, um, I'm not sure if you know, but like charges repel each other. Okay, uh, so two positives are going to be trying to get away from each other as far as possible. Same thing if you have two negatives, they try to get away from each other as far as possible. Whereas if you have one positive and one negative, they will be attracted to each other, right? So over here, if they are charged, then you know these ones will try to push away from each other, right? causing them to move away faster. But as more and more H plus go over here, they will start to push back, right? So depending on the charge of the particle, it might be very fast at the beginning, the rate of diffusion, but then it will slow down substantially once you build up enough charges here to push back, okay? Um, it will be different if we are talking about a mix of positive and negative charges, right? That, then instead of uh, diffusing faster, the attraction force might capture them and cause them to not move as much, right? So it depends on the charge. Um, we're gonna come back to this concept in, uh, in lecture five, when we look at how energy are being produced. All right, next thing we're gonna talk about is osmosis. Okay. Osmosis is basically the diffusion of water. Uh, let me just try to explain this to you um, uh, and, and the note over here. It's uh, usually a little bit confusing for people. Uh, let me just write down for you. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. All right, so let's try to set this up first. Okay, uh, just to keep it simple, let's say we have a tank here, and we are going to have a membrane in the middle that separates the tank. So this membrane has some gaps in it. We're going to fill it up with water on both sides. Okay, and it's going to be the same water level. Right. Oh, by the way, uh, I check with um, I check with the um, uh, program officer. Uh, apparently, we are not offering uh, any in-person uh, classes for second semester in the fall. So that's why uh, that option is not available. Um, some of you were asking about it, right, uh, last class. So only online option is available for semester two in, um, in September. OK, so here is uh, my tank, right? Uh, and uh, what happens is we will we will dissolve some salt in it, okay, or some particles. Now these particles are really big. Okay, let's draw them big. Okay. I'm just gonna maybe put one here, or, or put two here, okay, and then put more here. Now, at the bottom, that is going to be like this membrane is only permeable 
to water. That means only water can pass through. Okay, because the, the gaps are really, really small, these big molecules, they are not going to be able to pass through. Okay, so these red balls, they are solute. It doesn't really matter what they are. Solute are just things that are dissolved in, uh, in the water, right? So if you leave this alone for you know, a couple hours or even maybe a day, which way will the water move? Remember, the red balls cannot pass through the small gaps. Only water can move. So is it to the left, as in this way? Is it to the right? Or is it no movement? All right, so let me, uh, I, I know someone was uh, telling me the answer, uh, but let's do a poll. Which way is it going to move? Okay, anyone else? Okay, so we have a fairly, um, you know, uniform distribution here. Uh, one third of you say is left, one third of you say is right, one third of you say is no movement. Okay, so remember the red balls cannot move, right? If the red balls can move, then um, they, they will move to the right side, right? But the, the key thing here to know is that this membrane is only permeable to water. Right? So um, the red circles are, are stuck where they are. So over here, this is more concentrated, right? Initially, this is more concentrated because it has more dots um, within the same volume. And here, this is less concentrated. So things always try to balance themselves out, right? Uh, and in this case, in order to make the concentration the same, the water will have to move to the left side. Okay, So as water moves to the left, let me try to redraw this picture for you. I'm just going to copy it and see if it's going to go. There we go. As water moves to the left, the water level will actually rise on the left side. Right? So we're going to go up like that. And then the water level on the right is actually going to drop. OK. Like that. So now you have a new water level on the left and a new water level on the right. And then you will still have the membrane right in the middle. Okay, so water moved to the left. Now, how does that help? Well, you are adding more liquid to the left side. So you are diluting the solution, right? It's like, you know, those uh, powder food punch, right? If it's too sweet, afterwards you just add more water to it, right? So that dilutes it. And over here, because we are removing the water, we are making it more concentrated. So afterwards, the two sides would have the same concentration, right? And that is osmosis, right? the movement of water um, towards the more concentrated side. So I'm going to put a star here uh, in osmosis. Water always move towards the more concentrated location. Okay. Does anybody want to ask anything to clarify for me to clarify for you? I said the yeah, go ahead, Christina, and then uh, Memphier. 
I was just gonna ask why why did the water move to the one side I'm like I'm not getting that okay uh sure I'll get to that in a second uh and Memphir what's your question that member allows that water to move right the water can pass through the membrane o only the water yeah the membrane only allows the water to move and not the red dot so we didn't boil it like we didn't do anything no yeah it will on its own it yeah, it will on it on its own move to the left. I know it's hard to hard to visualize, right? But here is um here is something that might help you relate it. Uh, if you take a spoon of salt and put it in your mouth and hold it there, what's gonna happen? Like you don't don't swallow it, just keep it there for like I don't know, 15 seconds. What's gonna happen? Anybody done that before? It'll like develop a lot of saliva. Exactly, right? Exactly, right? So the salt is sucking the water out of your mouth, right? This is what happens. This is so the that has more salt is bringing the water over kind of like Exactly. Healthy. This is saltier, right? This is saltier because there is more solute and and just like the salt in the mouth is sucking the water out of your mouth, it's sucking the water towards itself, right? Towards the side. Does that help a little bit? It does. It does. It okay. does. Yeah. I just thought, like, why why did the water just move just randomly? I just, like, I couldn't understand. Right. But I so, the yeah. salt is bringing it, like, attracting it. Right. So, like, it's that, that's how what people do, right, with uh, with uh, preserving food, right? You can salt the fish, salt the, the meats, right? By removing the moisture, you prevent bacteria growth, right? And that's essentially a demonstration of what osmosis is. Okay. So, I hope that uh, helps you a little bit. Um, this you. yeah no problem this is the professional drawing all right so we have a u-shaped tube here and we have a selectively permeable membrane down at the bottom okay so if you leave it b in this case the water will move to the right right so uh the water level will drop on the left side and then the water level will rise on the right side okay make sure you understand this uh i i think on the Test or quiz, um, I, I, I have a question on this, right? That shows you this tube and then asks you to predict what's going to happen, right? So um, overall- sorry, Professor, I have a question. So um, where we have a more particles on the right side, it means it's a highly concentrated, right? Yeah, it's more concentrated. The key is that they, they are the same volume, right? So if you have more red dots per, um, per unit volume, then it, it's more concentrated, right? So in this picture, this is high concentration. We use square brackets to represent concentration, okay? And this is low concentration. Now, I need you guys to understand. Um, I am so not asking a question. So, um, can we just use a log logic? So, where the solution is more concentrated, so the solution is going to move to th that side. Yeah, but then I, I was going to say, right, you have to be careful. Uh, this is only true because the membrane does not allow the red particles to move, right? If 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 the if the membrane allows water and red particle to move, then the red particles will move to the left side, right? Okay, because of diffusion. Right? So diffusion is just movement of solutes, the red dots. It will go from high to low. The only reason it's not able to do that is because we have a membrane here that prevents them from moving. So when the particles cannot move, then the only other thing that can move is water. So in that sense, the water will always move towards the more concentrated side, which is what we wrote down here, right? In osmosis, that is when we are just tracking the water, water will move towards the more concentrated location. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on. So we are going to talk about three uh, scenarios here. Uh, please write these down, draw it out. Right. So we will uh, call this the osmosis or movement of water. Movement of water in different solution okay. 
Okay, if you if you are writing this, no, I uh, I recommend you doing it sideways, and then you know think divide the page into three slots. We're gonna write something here. We're gonna write something here. We're gonna write something here. Okay. Just stop me if you guys have questions. Right? Just use the raise hand button. All right. So we're gonna start with a beaker. And we're gonna fill it up with um, water. And we will put a cell in the water, animal cell. Okay, animal cell. Um, and uh, the concentration of the solution inside the cell, in this case, is same as the concentration of the solution, okay? So concentration of solution equals to concentration of cytoplasm, we'll say. Okay. Now, another thing is, uh, it's, this is more like a chemistry thing, but it's not about the number of dots you have, right? Some people are like, but you got more dots outside than inside, right? It's not about the number of dots, right? Like concentration equals to the um, solute divided by volume, okay? So on the outside, because there's more volume to achieve the same concentration, you will need to have more dots as well, right? So don't just count the dots. In the previous uh, diagram, right, this has more dots and therefore is more concentrated, but they have the same volume on both sides, right? Okay, so, so that's why this turns out to be more concentration with more dots. Um, regardless, the key thing to know here is that the concentration outside is equal to the concentration inside. This type of solution, we say isotonic, isotonic. I'm just going to pause for a second, let you catch up and uh, um, ask questions if you have any. All right, so in this case, which way is water going to move? Well, the solution is the same on the outside and on the inside. So you will have water moving out and you will also have water moving in at the same rate, okay? So rate of water moving in into the cell equals to rate of water leaving the cell. Okay. What's the end result? No net water movement. Okay. It's not no movement, they are still moving, but you get the exact same amount moving in as the amount that's leaving. So overall, no net movement. Okay, they cancel each other. So what happens? Uh, next thing is no change. No change in cell volume. You're not gaining any water, you're not losing any water, so the cell remains the same, okay? If this is an animal cell, it is very happy, okay? Animal cells, like our cells, we love isotonic uh, environment. If this is a plant cell, Okay, they are okay. Right? They're like not super happy, 
but not super sad either. They're like, meh, it's okay, I'll live. So that's isotonic. Any question about isotonic? That's the easy one. Okay, everything just the same. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mona. Why plant so it's uh, not not happy? Sorry, I didn't get it. Yeah, I, I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you later. Okay, because the, because plant loves water, right? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. They, they 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 want more water to come in. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, the situation where they will be happy, and then you understand. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, just <laughs> keep that in mind for now. All right. Scenario number two. We have another beaker here. All right, I hope you're drawing this, okay? Don't just watch me draw it. You gotta draw it to understand, especially if this is the first time you are doing this, okay? So we're gonna put another cell here. And uh, in this case, we are gonna, we're gonna have more concentrated solution outside compared to inside, okay? So you can add like a lot of dots to help you emphasize that, okay? So this is called hypertonic, hypertonic, okay? So in this case, the concentration of solution is greater than, greater than, concentration of cytoplasm. Based on everything I told you so far, do you expect water to be leaving the cell or do you expect them to be coming into the cell? I want you to think about that. Coming into the cell. Okay, so I have one person say leaving, one person say, coming into the cell, okay. The rest of you can just think about it, okay? In this situation, which way will water move? Okay. So earlier today we said, right? Water always move towards the more concentrated location, right? So in this case, where is the more concentrated location? The water will move outside. Move out. That's right, outside of the cell, right? So you will have water moving out. Okay, it doesn't mean you don't have water coming in. You will have some coming in, but overall you have more leaving than coming in. Okay, so rate of water, what, the, what order did I write at? Okay, moving into the cell, moving into the cell, is less than rate of water leaving the cell. All right. Now, if you have a hard time understanding this, let me show you another picture here, okay? Just take a look first. Okay. This over here is, is like this. It's like I have a I have a bucket and uh, I'm gonna turn on the tap, okay? So the tap is gonna be filling up the bucket, yes? With water. There we go. What is going on? Okay, it's filling up the bucket. And then uh, I'm gonna poke a hole at the bottom. Poke a hole at the bottom. Where's the hole? Gonna poke a hole at the bottom. And then water will leak, right? So if the water coming in from the tab is at the same rate as the rate that is leaking out, then the water level don't change, right? That's why the cell volume remains the same. Now over here, what is it gonna look like? We're gonna have the bucket again. And this time we are going to be turning on the tab once again. 
Okay, we're going to be turning on the tap. And then the water is going to be coming in. Okay. Uh, sorry. So all these color. Water is going to be coming in. But then you have a really big hole this time in the bucket. Super big hole. Like that. All right. So like you're really leaking out. All right. So what's going to happen over time to the, uh, to the water level? Is the water level going to rise, no change, or go down? Common sense, right? I hope it's common sense. <laughs> what's, the, what's the water level going to do? Do you guys understand this, right? What's going to happen to the water level in this case? goes down it goes down thank you okay, i was getting worried a little bit um hopefully the rest of you also understand that right because you're leaking more right? right so in this case right what happens to cell volume the cell shrinks okay the cell shrinks right? there is a term for this is called plasmolysis So afterwards, let me draw it out for you again. Right? The cell is going to shrivel up like that. Okay, these are just the solute and the cell shrivel up. If it's animal cell, okay, it's like meh, not happy but not gonna die. If it's plant cell, this is no good. Okay. If you have a plant at home and you forgot to water them for like a couple of weeks, right? They are like all sad looking, right? The leaves are like all like shrivel up, right? If you know what I mean. That's that's a hypertonic situation for the plant. It's gonna die if you leave it like that. For humans, this situation occurs when I should ask you when 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 would this happen in a in a person in us? What situation are you going to be in when this happens? Just brainstorm, right? Whatever Maybe comes to you. Maybe when the cell has more water content. Uh, just don't, don't think too hard, okay? Think about like, as a person, what do you do or not do so that your body is going to be in a hypertonic environment? Don't, don't think too hard about like what happens to the cellular or just think about things that you do every day. Drink water. If Maybe you drink bye. water? Did you say if you drink water, Mona? No, it's not drink water. Oh, not drink water. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? So if you are dehydrated, right? Like on a hot summer day like today, 30 degrees, and you are outside, you know, running around, not drinking water, not rehydrating, then your body is going to, the blood is going to become hypertonic, and your cells are going to shrink. Does that make sense? Uh, now, you, you're not going to die from it unless it's like prolonged dehydration. Okay? So your cell will shrink. You actually have cells in the brain that will shrink. And the shrinking of those cells in the brain, in the, in the hypothalamus, will cause you to feel thirsty. And then you will want to rehydrate. Are, are we okay, guys? Still quiet this morning. Uh, any, any questions before I move on to the last case? Is that why they said that, um, I guess, your brain uses a lot of water? Uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, but, you know, in general, the body is 70% water, right? It's not just the brain that requires the water. Um, so it's a good idea to, to stay hydrated at all times. And is it why we might get headaches if we're not hydrated? Yeah, that's one of the reasons, right? When you don't have adequate... Uh, uh, 
fluid in your body, then the circulation is not doing too good, and and that could restrict um, some of the vessels in the in the brain, which could contribute to uh, to headaches. Very good. Okay, so last case here. Uh, you probably can guess at this time we have very concentrated on the inside. Okay, very concentrated on the inside. So uh, the concentration, concentration of solution is less than concentration of cytoplasm. Okay. So this time, think about which way the water will be moving. Are there wa more water coming in or going out? Well, going in, water coming in. That's right, going in, right? Because earlier we said, right, water osmosis will move towards the more concentrated side. So you have all these water coming in. Right? You will have some leaving too, just not as much. Okay, so rate of, is that the wrong color, right? Oh yeah, it's the wrong color. That's why it looks a little bit off. Okay, so more water coming in than leaving. So rate of water coming into the cell is going to be greater than rate of water leaving the cell. In my tap analogy, okay, we are going to crank up the water tap. Okay, so we're going to turn it on to the max. Lots of water coming in. And then this is just regular side hole leaving, leaking. So what happens to the water level? Decreasing is up. It's increasing, right? It's gonna be going up and eventually it's gonna spill over, right? Okay. So uh, instead of saying the cell shrink, the cell swells, okay? If it's animal cell, it might burst. We call this lysis. So this is not good for animal cells. If it's plant cell, right, it's going to be happy. Cell wall prevents bursting. Okay, so all that extra water coming in will push against the cell wall, and that's what helps the leaves to open up, and your plant is looking happy, and um, and it's thriving in that condition. Okay, sir. So um, I'm sorry. What that's process are you explaining here? Oh, I forgot to give you the name. Right. Thank you. This is hypotonic. Okay. okay. Hypotonic. Now, you can remember this with the big O because that's what happens to your cell. Your cell will get super, super, super big like a balloon and then it will burst open. Okay. It will explode if it's an animal cell. Right? It's going to explode. Everything's going to come out. All right. So, isotonic, normal state. That's why we prefer hypertonic is when we are dehydrated and hypotonic is, uh, believe it or not, you can drink too much water. Okay? If you drink too much water, it will dilute your blood so much uh, that your cell will start to burst and that is dangerous. There was a contest, uh, like a host by like a radio station um, in the States 
you guys know that uh, like the Wii, right? Some of you probably know what that is. That's like a video game console, right? Okay, so when it first came out, this radio station hosted a competition. Uh, it's called Hold Your Wii, as in your P, or your urine, right? To win the Wii. And that's what the contest was called. And contestant had to drink uh, a lot of water, okay? Like liters of water. They have to drink it and hold it and not pee. And the person who can hold it in uh, wins the video game console. So this this woman won the game because she was the only one who was able to hold it with, after drinking all the water. Uh, and hours later, she died in her apartment. Right? As we just learned, if you drink excessive amount of water in a short period of time, it dilutes your blood. It makes your blood hypotonic. Then your blood cells will start to burst, right? If you burst enough red cells, you don't have enough red cells to circulate oxygen uh, for your body, right? And you die. That's, all, that's one of the reasons why you die, okay? There are other things too. You're diluting your electrolytes and we need electrolytes uh, to, uh, uh, for normal bodily functions, such as neuronal communication, muscle contraction, right? All these things, right? Um, so that's why, like, if, if it's on a hot summer, summer day, sure, drink your water, but don't just drink excessive amount of water, right? That's what those Gatorades and stuff are for. They are mostly sugar, for, for uh, that's true, but it also contains important electrolytes, right? Is it true that Bruce Lee died because of too much water? I have absolutely no idea. Uh, <laughs> could be, could be one of those uh, legend things. Who knows? We should uh, we should look it up though. Sorry, professor. So, yeah. um, is that a reason some when person gets drowned, they get a, a they die because of the excessive water in the cells? If uh, if the if a water person, if a person gets drowned, drunk, like drink too much alcohol. No, no, drowned in in the. Oh, drowned. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. No, drowning is different, right? Drowning is um, drowning is just not being able to breathe, right? Okay, but you do raise an interesting uh, question because uh, pathologically speaking, um, you know, the drowning in in fresh water will will cause your cell to look different compared to drowning in ocean water. Okay, if you look at the lung cells of people who drown. Um, people who drown in the ocean, the lung cells would be all shriveled up because the ocean is salty water, right? But if it's fresh water, uh, then it's hypotonic. Then the lung cells, they would burst. Do you understand the relationship here? Yes, thank you. All right. So that is that. Now, I, I'm guessing that a lot of you uh, quite a bit but throughout the oh okay she's so, so talking about how much water you drink yeah so like my my mom uh followed this things religiously she she has to drink eight cups of water a day like she she have this calendar that she keeps track of, of how how many cups of water she drink it doesn't matter if it's like 9 p.m at at night and uh you know if she hasn't drink um enough water that day she would she would make sure she drink eight cups before going to bed and you know I, i'm just telling you look, this is not a smart thing to do mom it's 9 p.m you shouldn't be drinking two cups of water you're going to be up all night going to the bathroom she's like i, I gotta you know <laughs> drink eight cups a day right so that's like a, a health thing right that people follow right they think so vincent yeah is, is it just water or is it just just liquid because we're getting fluid from other sources throughout the day so is it just from the water itself or you're talking, you're talking about liquid? my mom or are you talking about in general? no in general <laughs> <laughs> yeah in general i mean like you know the the new thing is um what i believe anyways is you drink when you are thirsty right yeah. like we don't we don't eat like 24 7 right just because we need to meet certain calorie intake right we eat when we're hungry right so same thing goes with the water your body tells you when you need water right so there's not a lot of ground science behind you know having eight cups uh, a day but you know like you're right any kind of fluid is 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 fine right like you you know you you, you have fluid from your fruits and stuff like that too right and would uh, you say um for this process, like it would be seasonal as well. Like say for in the summer days. Yeah, of course, right? On the summer days, like today. More hydration than exactly. in the winter time. That's right, okay. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, 
you know, you know how parents are. They, uh, they don't listen to their kids. Um, anyways, so <laughs> this is, uh, this is the professional drawing and, uh, and, and that's what, um, that's what they look like under the microscope. Okay. These are real red cells in a hypotonic situation. It swells up and then, uh, uh, you know, it might burst. It might not burst. It might just swells up. And if you, if you, um, get rid of the water fast enough, then they will shrink again. Right. So, uh, having too much water, like I said, could kill you. Uh, it's it's called water toxicity. Okay, you can look it up. Uh, and on the other hand, they shrink up. Plasmolysis. That's the term. Now, uh, I am guessing a lot of students in our program are trying to go into practical nursing, right, or some other healthcare related um, uh, program. Uh, and if you are going to become a nurse. Uh, or practical nurse, then you might, you know, someday be administering intravenous solution. Right? And that's something that relates to what we are learning right now. Okay? So IV intravenous solution has to be tailored to the patient's need. Right? So in general, if the person is healthy uh, and they just need a bit of, uh, of, of IV because maybe they cannot eat or something like that due to other uh, maybe maybe they're getting ready for surgery. They cannot eat, right? Then you give them IV fluids. Um, these fluids has to be isotonic to the cell, okay? Otherwise, you're going to cause the cell to swell or shrink. We don't want that. So that's the general situation. Now, isotonic uh, is about 0.9% uh, uh, normal saline, okay? So this is, uh, this is the same, same, same concentration as your blood. 0.9%, which you will learn in chemistry later, uh, is essentially 0 0.9 grams of salt, NaCl, uh, per 100 milliliter of water. That's what that is, okay? And, and these are commonly used for hydration purposes. So if someone is suffering from um, excessive bleeding, okay, maybe from a uh, uh, accident or something, right? If they're vomiting or if they're having severe diarrhea, um, you need to rehydrate a person. So you would give them normal saline, okay? Uh, as you might or might not know, diarrhea is it's, it's one of the leading cause of death in, uh, in children um, who don't have access to fresh water, uh, fresh clean water in, uh, in, in some of the poorer countries. Um, and so, you know, because, because they don't have a means of rehydrating them. Um, so excessive loss of water through diarrhea without hydration will cause them to, uh, to die, right? So it's a serious thing. Now, in some cases, we want to administer 0.45%. Uh, so do you think this is a uh, uh, hypotonic or hypertonic compared to the 0.9? Again, you can just think about it and then I'll tell you in a second. Normal is 0.99%. This is 0.45%. So it's less than the normal, right? Which makes it hypotonic. So when do you want to give someone hypotonic solution? Oh, actually it says right here. I didn't even, even read my own notes. Okay. So uh, why do you want to give someone hypotonic? Well, sometimes uh, people have hypernaturemia. Now, that's a big word. Hyper means too much as opposed to hypo. Natri, that is talking about sodium, right? Uh, the symbol for sodium is Na because it's natrium, right? And emia means in the blood. So this is too much sodium in the blood. So if the person is severely, severely de dehydrated, then you, you might want to give them a bit of hypotonic solution, right? Because the cells are like super shrivel up. You want to want them to swell up again. Or in people who have diabetes, sometimes they get ketoacidosis, right? Uh, you don't have to really know what this means, but basically one of the things that diabetic patient has is that they metabolize their um, fat and, and that creates these byproducts called ketones, okay? Uh, and ketones can cause your blood to become acidic. So you need to dilute the blood and flush it. And that's when you're gonna give some hypotonic solution. 3% uh, hypertonic saline, that is, uh, three times as concentrated as this, right? So um, that is to treat hyponatremia. So the person who has water toxicity, not only does she need to pee it out, but you want to rebalance the blood.
by giving her a little bit of the uh, hypertonic solution as well. So this is uh, this is related to uh, to healthcare. All right, that's it. Uh, move. Any question before I move on to the next big topic? Anything at all? So are you saying that there's different um, types of ceiling, like not all ceiling is the yeah, same? Yeah, not all ceiling is the same, right? It dep depends on the need, like I said here, right? Uh, and, and you will have to give the right kind. If, if the person okay. is already suffering from uh, too much sodium and you end up giving them like a hypertonic, you're going to make the situation worse, right? Wow. I thought it was just the one thing in the bag. No, all the, the, yeah, all the bags are different, yeah. <laughs> Okay, next thing we're going to talk about is uh, the type of transport. All right, so type of transport can be separated into two categories. We have the active transport on one hand that requires a TP. On the other hand, we have the passive transport, which does not require a TP. And there are different examples of each that we will look at. So overall, Passive transport will not use ATP, as I said, and it involves movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. Well, you already know an example of this, right? Diffusion. Like that blue dye that you add into the water, it will automatically spread out. No energy is required. It just moves from the concentrated drop to less concentrated area. Active transport requires ATP from the cell. So again, you make ATP by breaking down your food, right? Then you store that energy. And when you need the energy, you will break the ATP, energy will be released, and then you can move molecules from low concentration to high concentration. Sometimes it's a bit abstract for people to visualize what high and low concentration look like. A better way to see this is um you know think of a a, a, a a hill right if you're on top of the hill it takes n n almost no effort to push a boulder down the hill right you just give it a little notch and then it will just fall down on its own this is passive transport active transport is going uphill from low to high from a low concentration to high concentration you need to push it up and that requires effort okay um, that's essentially is the difference between the two. So let's start with passive transfer part first. Okay. Again, just to reiterate, no ATP going from high concentration to low concentration. The square bracket is the symbol for concentration. Okay. You will learn that in chemistry as well. So an example of passive transport, simple diffusion. Uh, we already talked about it, right? But specifically, what kind of molecule uses simple diffusion? Things that are small, like water molecule, they could use simple diffusion. Hydrophobic molecules will have no problem crossing the cell membrane because the cell membrane uh, has a hydrophobic layer in between, right? So anything that's lipid-based will be able to pass through with relative ease. Um, gas like carbon dioxide, oxygen, if it's small, if it's not charged, they are able to go through like that, okay? Another example is osmosis, okay? The water will move in and out on its own, depending on which side has the higher solute concentration. Now, there is another type called facilitated diffusion, okay? This is also passive transport, all right, but the molecules are too big to cross on their own. Right, I'll write it down. Uh, molecules are too big to cross membrane themselves. So they will cross with the help of a protein. Right. So that's called facilitated diffusion. It is still going from high concentration to low concentration, but you just need the help of a, of a, of a protein. 
So big molecules like glucose is going to use this method. Uh, charged particles will also use this method because charged particles cannot pass through the phospholipid bilayer, right? It cannot pass through the hydrophobic tails. Okay. Cannot pass through hydrophobic tails. Okay. So here is a channel protein, okay, uh, which is an example of a facilitated diffusion. There are two types. There's a channel protein, and then there's the carrier protein. So channel protein is easy to understand. Right? It, it's an integral protein that inserts itself uh, within the membrane. And there is a tunnel in the middle. Right? So the particle will be able to move through the tunnel right, without interacting with the uh, with the uh, phospholipid bilayer. So the ions, like the calcium 2 plus that I talk about, they are going to be transported this way. Okay. So the channel protein shields the particle from the hydrophobic tail, and it's able to pass through. If the concentration changes, if there's more uh, calcium on the inside and outside, then the direction of movement will change as well. Okay. The other one is carrier protein. Okay. So in this case, this is like Pac-Man, right? Like it grabs onto the molecule and then it opens on the other side and splits it out. Okay. Uh, this one is stationary. It's just there. It's like, a, it's like an open door. It just goes in and out. This one is like one of those turning doors. The molecule uh, has to bind to the protein and then it turns and then it gets out on the other side. Glucose, use this method to pass through. So that's a facilitated diffusion, all right? Factors that affects, uh, why? Oh, hold on, before we do that, do you guys have any question uh, about facilitated diffusion and how it differs from like simple diffusion? Sumana, you have a question? I see you uh, unmute your mic. No. No? Yeah? OK, no. All right. So there are different factors that affects membrane permeability. Um, we already talked about membrane composition, right? So sometimes you have more, cons more saturated fat, less saturated fat more cholesterol, less cholesterol, that would change the fluidity of the membrane. But other factors such as temperature, pH, uh, ion concentration, as well as the type of environment is in, will also have an effect on the membrane permeability. So your first lab, the beetroot experiment, you will be examining how temperature affects the membrane permeability of beetroot, all right? Uh, so I would not be here for the lab. Uh, Professor Hairi will take over and uh, he, will, uh, he will explain to you what you have to do for the lab. Uh, it's done online anyway. So like, you know, you don't, you don't have to physically do an experiment. Um, you, you fill out a lab report and then you submit it. It's, it's pretty straightforward, okay? So I received an email last night asking if you can start on the lab uh, now. I would wait, okay? Wait until he explains the situation to you. You will have about a week to, to, to complete it. It's very straightforward assignment, um, but that, that would be, uh, that would be um, in his portion of the course, okay? We, we couldn't get it worked out. Like if I do the lab, then I won't be here to administer the test uh, for you. Um, and, and, you know, I want to be here to, to give you the test so that in case you have any questions, you can ask me, right? All right, let's just uh, do a few poll questions and uh, we, uh, we're gonna have a quick okay, So you're leaving and then you're coming back? I'm not coming back um, for, for this course. I mean, like uh, I think I have two more weeks with you guys um, and then, and then the, the other prof's gonna take over and then uh, 
I'll be back in September though. Yeah, if, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> Okay, so passive membrane uh, transport pros processes include, okay, you can choose one of these things. And then I will launch the poll. All right, so uh, let's see. First one, consumption of ATP. That is not it, okay? Passive membrane transport does not require ATP, okay? ATP is only needed for active transport. Movement of substance down is concentration gradient. That's the right one, right? From high to low, right? The use of transfer protein when moving substance area from low to high. When you see low to high, you know it's not correct. Movement of water from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, that is also not true, okay? This is just for osmosis, right? Not passive transport in general. All right, let's do another one here. All right, hypertonic, that is the one where the cell is gonna shrivel up, okay? Because water is leaving, okay? Hypo is the one that where it gets big, right? So net movement of water out of the cell, that's correct. The cell will not burst because water is leaving. So instead it will shrink uh, and uh, it's not gonna burst, like I said. Solution concentration is higher outside of the cell compared to the inside. That's why the water is leaving. Right? So the core answers are A, C, and E. Okay, uh, let's just take a five minute break and we will do more afterwards. See you in a bit. Hello, it's me again. Let's keep going. Next, um, we're gonna. Sorry, professor, can you please explain the last um, question that we did? This one. Uh, yes, please. Okay, so did you you remember hypertonic, right? Hypertonic is this situation right here. 
So it's more concentrated on the outside than it is inside. And therefore you have water um, leaving the cell, right? Yeah, so after all the water leaves the cell, it shrinks up. Right? And, and uh, looking at the choices, right? Net movement of water out of the cell, which causes it to shrink. And why was the water leaving the cell? Because the solution has a, has a higher concentration outside compared to the inside. Okay, just compare these answers with the notes. Uh, you should be able to, uh, to work them out, okay? All right, next we have the active transport, which does require ATP. And we are going against the concentration gradient. We are going from low concentration to high concentration. Uh, so just to recap, so far we talked about two types of passive transport, simple diffusion, which are used by small molecules like water and gas like oxygen, carbon dioxide. If the molecule is big, such as glucose, or if it's charged like an ion, then it would need the help of a membrane protein. Uh, and those type of transport is called facilitated diffusion. You can either use a channel protein, which is the one that is uh, 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 just an integral protein with a tunnel in the middle. And then this is the one that looks like Pac-Man, right, where it grabs onto a molecule and physically uh, move it to the other side uh, by changing the shape of the protein. So now we're gonna be talking about uh, active transport. And we have two examples here, a protein pump or bulk transport. Let's start with protein pump. There is something called the sodium potassium pump. Right? Um, you will learn much more about this in the second semester. It is a key uh, pump that allows our nerve to communicate with each other. All right? So uh, uh, for normal, for the uh, neurons, the brain cells to be functioning normally, you would need to have high concentration of potassium on the inside and low concentration of sodium on the inside. Okay, don't worry about why now. That's just the way it is, all right? So uh, do I have a picture here? Yeah, so over here, the, um, the purple squares are sodium and then the uh, beige uh, circles, they are the potassium. So like I said, in order for this to work, you need to have high potassium and low sodium in the cell, okay? which means the sodium potassium pump needs to keep on sending sodium out and keep on bringing potassium in. Right? And that is going against the concentration gradient. Because if you keep on pumping so, uh, potassium in, you already have high potassium on the inside. So, you know, the outside is going to be low potassium. And to bring more in, you are going uphill. You're going against the concentration gradient. All right. So that's what the sodium potassium pump does. It brings in three, uh, brings in two potassium. And in exchange, it will send out two sodium. And over time, if this keeps on happening, you will end up having high uh potassium on the inside and low sodium on the inside, okay? Don't worry about this thing here. Right? We're not gonna learn about it. So that's one example of, of a protein pump. We have different kinds of pumps in the body, right? Some are responsible for pumping H+, some are responsible for pumping um, calcium, right? It depends on the function of the cell. Um, and just as an example, uh, for a protein pump, we will use sodium potassium pump, uh, to illustrate that, okay? Next, we have bulk transport. Bulk means like a lot of something, right? So in bulk transport, you are trying to move like either like an entire bacteria uh, or sometimes really, really big particles like cholesterol across the cell membrane. You can either be bringing things in, which is going to be called endocytosis, to bring things into the cell. Okay, endo is to bring it in, endocytosis. And the opposite, to send things out, 
out of the cell, that would be exocytosis. And both are examples of uh, bulk transport because we are not just moving a small amount of things, we're moving a lot of them uh, uh, at, uh, at the same time, all right? This is what exocytosis looks like. Remember, uh, was it last class? Maybe it was last class, maybe it was the class before. I honestly don't remember the days all blend together. We, uh, we do this, right? We have, a, we have a protein that is made in the rough ER, and then it's gonna go to the Goji body. It gets sorted and repackaged. And one of the destinations of this repackaged protein is to be released from the cell. Right. So how does it get released from the cell? Well, it's going to get released through the process of exocytosis. So here we have the vesicle. It's going to fuse with the membrane right, and become part of the membrane. Uh, and then all the particles inside will be released out of the cell. Yeah, so that's exocytosis, sending things out. We can do the opposite. We can bring it in. Right? And that's just the reverse. We, we want to bring all these green particles in, these green circles. So you fold in the cell membrane and keep on folding it until these two parts touches each other. And then it pinches off from the cell membrane. And there you create a vesicle. Now this vesicle might join with the lysosome or something to break down the green particles. Right. It doesn't really matter where it goes. The point is you're bringing in a lot of stuff. That is endocytosis. Now, this thing never ends. I know it just keeps on going, going, but we, we are almost there, guys. Um, there are three different types of uh, uh, three different types of endocytosis. Okay. You can be eating things. You can be bringing in a bacterial cell, right, such as this one. Right. This is a white cell. This is a, some kind of bacterial cell. If you're eating a bacteria, that's called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis, cell eating. Uh, sometimes you are just bringing in fluids. So that's called pinocytosis. Right. Human egg does that right, to get nutrients from the surrounding. So cell eating is phagocytosis. Cell drinking, that's pinocytosis. Okay. And then there is the last kind, which is called receptor mediated endocytosis. Uh, it's easier if I show you what it looks like. It works just like regular kind of endocytosis, but then there are special receptors on it. You are not randomly bringing things in. You are choosing what you are bringing in. So uh, in order to bring in these uh, yellow particles, they have to fit the receptor, right? Let's say we have some like hexagon molecules, which doesn't fit the receptor, then that won't trigger this process. So there is an added control um, regulation to this process, right? So you have to have a receptor first before you are allowed to bring in it. So to summarize, bulk transport, we have exocytosis, which is just sending things out. We have endocytosis, which is to bring it in. And depending on what and how you are bringing it in, we have different names for it. If you are just bringing in liquid, then we say pinocytosis. If you are bringing in solid, like a bacteria, we say phagocytosis. If you are bringing it in, but they have to match a receptor, like a key and lock kind of situation, right? They have to match the, you have to have the right key for the locks before you can bring it in then we say receptor-mediated endocytosis. Okay, so that's all the different types of transport. Can you say the last one again, please? The receptor one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so again, it's the same as bringing things in regularly, but there is an extra step. You, you can't just bring anything in you want. Whatever you're bringing in has to match a particular receptor. Okay, so like in this picture, right? If you, if you want to bring in these yellow circles, you have to be able to fit them into the receptor first. If it doesn't fit the receptor, you can't bring it in. 
Does it make any sense? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. It's like that toy, right? That kids have. What do you call that thing? Like the shape sorter or something? Right? Like if, if, if you have like a, I don't know, like a, like this, this thing, okay? That's not going to fit into any other hole, right? So you can't bring it in. That's, that's kind of like that. It has to fit the receptor before you can bring it in. Okay, uh, that is that. Let's just do a bunch of uh, questions here. Uh, which of the following can cross the cell membrane easiest? All right, let's do something, guys. I still want to start on lecture five for a little bit. So pick something, please. All right, thank you. Which of falling crosses the cell membrane easiest? Uh, so you want something small, right? And so anything that's not small is not going to be a answer, right? So large, we don't want that, okay? Uh, a bacterium is pretty big, right? So that's no. Uh, all hydrophilic molecules, hydrophilic molecules cannot cross the membrane, right? The things that can cross the membrane on their own are hydrophobic molecules, right? Okay. Uh, uh, charged particles, right? That's not going to work because charged particle requires, needs, Facilitate it. Diffusion. Okay, so the correct answer is C. Only two person chose it. Uh, good job, I guess, if you chose that. But uh, the rest of you who did not choose C, I hope I have uh, convinced you why that is the answer. Okay, anything that's charged, anything that's hydrophilic, they will have a hard time crossing the membrane. Because the membrane is has a thick hydrophobic layer in between, right? Remember that. All right, we are gonna. I was gonna let you guys uh, uh, discuss this one uh, in the breakout groups, but we don't have time for it. Uh, I will just uh, explain it. A patient has had a serious accident and lost a lot of blood. To replenish body fluids distilled water equal to the volume of blood loss is transferred directly into one of his veins. What will be the most probable result of this transfusion? Okay. Are we going to be helping the person or are we going to be like not helping the person over here? What do you guys think? Wouldn't you dilute the blood? You are absolutely correct, Samina. We will be diluting the blood and that is not good, right? If you dilute the blood, the cell will burst, right? You're gonna be introducing a hypo, you, you're introducing a hypotonic solution here, right? That's what distilled water is. Uh, and, uh, and that is not good, okay? So uh, cell will burst, okay? Not safe, not safe. Everybody get it? Not really. Could you tell us why again, sir? Okay. Do you know what the still water is? Oh, that's that's probably what. No, I don't yeah. know. Well, we did it before in chemistry class. Uh, the still water is just water, okay? Uh, <laughs> water with nothing in it, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you give water with nothing in it, is that 
isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic? Which one is it? If it's just. I think few. it's hyper. Um, hyper is the one that has a lot of uh, salt in it, right? Hypo. So this is hypo. Mm -hmm. If it's just water, then it's hypotonic, right? Hypo. No salt. Hypotonic. Right? If it's hypotonic, it means uh, the cell has more so, uh, solute than outside, right? So water is going to come in, cell will swell, and then it will burst. That's why it is not okay to give it to the person. Whether he has serious accident or not, it's like generally not okay to do this. Okay, so what, what should we be giving him instead? Hypertonic. Uh, anyone else? I'm not sure, but I'm. Just, it's just a guess. Wouldn't it be the IV? We are going to be giving him IV, yes. But which one are we going to be giving uh, the person? Are we giving them isotonic? Are we giving them hypotonic? Or are we Iso giving them isotonic? Isotonic, right? Yeah, that's right. Just the normal saline, right? I think that's what uh, Ivana is uh, typing. Does that right word now. come from isotopes? Like, I iso means the same. Right? Oh. Iso in general means the same, right? Um, yeah. Are, are we okay with this? Ask ask some question. I feel like you guys are uh, still not entirely uh, clear about this. I don't think we're gonna have time for lecture five uh, at this point, so we might as well clear clear this this thing up. Um, What's what, bothering you guys? Yeah, go ahead. Sabine. What's an isotonic? What is it? Isotonic means uh, right here. Isotonic means the concentration of the surrounding of the solution is same as the concentration inside the cell. If they are the same, then the amount of water leaving is same as the amount of water coming in. So your cell is not swelling up. Your cell is not shrinking. It's just the same. It wouldn't dilute. It wouldn't dilute it because like you, you're, you're getting more of the same thing. Right? Okay. And I guess you're trying to bring things back to a balance in the scenario that you gave. That's why you just want to, you just want to top it up basically. Okay. okay. Uh, I guess another, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of different ways to help you guys relate to this. All right. Let's let let's say let's say you uh you uh you have a cup of coffee, okay? If you don't drink coffee, think of tea. Okay? Think of tea. Here, here. That's the that's the tea here. Okay, or coffee. So you 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 lost some fluid because of the of the accident, right? So that's that's equivalent to that's equivalent to drinking some of your coffee. Okay, so now you have less coffee. Okay, less coffee. So you want you want to you want to top up your coffee, right? So should I just come up to you and then pour hot water into your cup? Would that would that be a good thing to do if you want to top up your coffee? No. No, because you're gonna dilute the coffee, right? You you're just gonna be adding water to it, right? You're not adding more of the same thing. So if I really want to top it up, I, I actually have to add the coffee, right? And not water, right? We have to add more coffee. So if the person is losing blood, you can't just add water. Adding water will dilute the, the blood, just like adding water to your coffee. You need to add more, quote, blood, right? Okay, but like he's not needing a transfusion in this case. So we have to add things that are isotonic, the same concentration as the existing stuff. Is that okay? All right, yeah. think, about, think about this, guys. All right, here's another question. This is a very long question. Uh, I'll let you read it. And uh, hopefully you choose something.
Okay, a lot of you still are probably thinking about it. Even though it's really, really lengthy, here's the key thing. We have a, we have a beaker that has a, a sucrose, which is sugar, right? Solu a concentration of 0 0.6 M. You don't really have to know what the M means. M stands for molar. You, you will learn that in chemistry later. But the idea is it's, the number is 0 0.6. Okay, and then you're gonna weigh the bag um, over the course of like 10 minutes interval. If the bag contains a solution isotonic to the 0.6, that's the key thing here, isotonic. What do you expect to happen to the bag, right? 90% uh, you know, of the people got it right. Nothing's gonna happen to the bag because it's isotonic, right? So think of the bag as the cell. It's not going to gain volume. It's not going to lose volume because it's high. It's, it's isotonic, right? Uh, things like A here, that would be a bag that is uh, hypotonic. Hypotonic, right? It, it's going to gain water. And then eventually it's gonna it's gonna flatten out, right? It's not gonna expand forever, right? Okay. As soon as those concentrations balance out, then you we won't gain water anymore, right? Same thing over here. This would be hypertonic. You will shrink, but you will stop shrinking once the levels are balanced out. Okay? B and C, uh, B and D is is not related to what we are talking about here. Uh, Trish asks, so isotonic state is balanced. That's right. That's the happy state, right, for animal cell. All right, last question here. Uh, almost everyone get this wrong the first time. You will probably see this question on a test or something. So uh, give it a try, okay? Give it a try. This is a tricky, tricky question. Okay, anyone else before I uh, tell you the answer? All right, uh, I have four people who chose uh, C as the answer. That's the correct one. Uh, can you explain to me why you chose C before I explain it? Maybe you guys will do a better job explaining it. I, just, I wanna know why you chose C. Why do you say no, ch no change in size? Whoever chose C, please. Um, the normal answer, I believe, would be swell and burst. But because you said it was a trick question, I want oh, to okay. <laughs> I see. <laughs> That's right. He's do, doing some reverse sense. psychology there. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to. I hope I wasn't overthinking it. But if, if, if it frees, when it frees, it will, it will, um, expand and then when it thaws it will shrink 
So when you put the hypotonic, doesn't it like bring it back to where it originally was? Okay, yeah. Interesting uh, comment. I'm going to address that later. Uh, uh, come on. Sorry. Yeah. sorry uh, I, I think uh, um, the cell uh, isn't alive uh, after freezing and uh, mm -hmm. powering. So uh, nothing, uh, nothing to do nothing after. To do. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, Anyone else want to say anything? Um, who chose? Who else chose C? I want to know the reason. Don't be shy. Tell me why. All right, that's fine. I'll tell you the reason. Uh, when you freeze a cell, actually, you know what? Before I tell you what happens when you freeze a cell, uh, can you tell me what happens when you freeze water? Like you ever do this, like a uh, plastic water, plastic bottle, and you fill it up to the brim, and then it you expands. put it to the freezer. It expands, right? Okay. Yes. Like if you've done this, like the bottle expands, right? And sometimes if it's too full, it's gonna burst, right? So that's what happens when you freeze animal cells. Okay. If you freeze an animal cell, the uh, the cell expand, and the ice crystal actually poke holes in the cell. Okay, so afterwards, when you when you thaw it, when you put it back into room temperature, and then you put it in a solution, it doesn't matter what solution you put it in. It doesn't matter if you put it in hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic. It doesn't matter. The cell is full of holes. Then water would just move in and out at will. Right? The membrane is no longer there. It's damaged. Right? That's why there will be no change in the uh, cell size. Do you understand? Okay, sir. Well, just one question. It was just a thought. Sure. So, so since animal cells and I guess human cells are like similar, correct? Human cells are animal cells, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, is um like when it comes to like fertility? That, and, that's exactly what I was gonna talk about next. Like Excellent question. Yeah. And reproduction, like yeah, um, yeah, yeah. this, uh, if they freeze sperms or um the eggs. How comes like it is it that they freeze it? Because I think that's a term that yeah, I hear. they freeze it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's excellent, right? Yeah. Usually people ask this question after after doing this multiple choice, right? They're like, wait, but don't people freeze their eggs or sperm for later on, right? Uh, if they want to decide to have kids later on. How come that doesn't kill the sperm, doesn't kill the egg? Um, so the short answer to that is um, it's a special solution. Yeah, you, know, you can you can put these cells in a solution that prevents the formation of ice crystal because it's the ice crystal that's puncturing the cell, right? Yeah, so if you, it's, it's kind of like an antifreeze, right? It's like your windshield fluid, right? Like you spray the windshield fluid, even if it's like minus 20, it's not gonna freeze up, right? It, it's like that, okay? But it's not exactly windshield fluid because that stuff is toxic, of course. So we have like a non-toxic version of these antifreeze basically. Um, that we are allowed to keep it cold, but not to a point that it's gonna, you know, kill all the sperm and eggs, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So uh, that's it. That's it. Okay, this is a chart that summarizes everything. Um, I will, I will post the information about the upcoming quiz on uh, on eCentennial shortly. And uh, I will see you all on Mon on when do I see you on Monday? Yeah, on Monday. Okay, so Monday is going to be the quiz, and we are going to have a lesson on lecture five as well. Lots of writing on Monday, uh, Monday's class. Okay, make sure you have notebook and, and everything. We're not going to be doing the PowerPoint too much. Like I said, the lecture five is very complicated. Um, it's just better if we write things out. Um, and then, then what what is what are we reviewing for the quiz? Yeah, the quiz is going to be lecture three and lecture four. Oh, so okay. on cells, uh, you will have to recognize some of the uh, organelles. I might give you an organelle and ask you to tell me what it does or like to label it. OK, uh, as well as everything we learned uh, this week. Will we be doing it on camera or? No, 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 no camera. Just like last time, exactly same as last time. It will be available from 6 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. You do it anytime during that, that period. Um, you know, 40 minutes, that okay. kind of stuff. All right. Okay.
okay, thank you. Bye. Enjoy your week. Email me if you have any questions. You too. Yeah.